We've learned previously that some chemical systems will react, but they won't react to completion. Instead, they'll come to a state, which is equilibrium, in which there includes some combination of reactants and products mixed together. We've also learned that this mixture can be described by an equilibrium constant. And there's an equilibrium constant expression um, that expresses the equilibrium constant in terms of the concentrations of products over the concentrations of reactants. In this video, we're going to learn what happens if we have a system that's at equilibrium and something happens to make it go out of equilibrium. So this principle is was previously described by Le Chatelier and is therefore known as Le Chatelier's principle. So let's state Le Chatelier's principle. It states that when a chemical system that is in equilibrium becomes for some reason disturbed, then the system will react in a direction that reestablishes this equilibrium. So there are several disturbances that we're going to cover in this video that will move a system away from its equilibrium position. The first one is if we change the concentration of some of the chemicals while the system is at equilibrium. A second one is if the system pressure is changed. The pressure will also end up resulting in a change in concentration, basically. And this is mostly affected, as, as we'll see, by changing the volume of the system. And then finally, we'll discuss what happens if we change the temperature of a system that is in chemical equilibrium. So the first disturbance we're going to talk about are concentration changes. So what I'm showing here is a very simple system again. A is in equilibrium with B. And I'm going to use a seesaw analogy here to explain equilibrium and how the disturbances can affect the equilibrium. So here on the left, I have two A's, and on the right, I have two B's. So if these reflected their concentrations, then my K value, my equilibrium constant, would be 2 over 2 or 1. And again, this is a very simple analogy. So if we think about what we know about a seesaw, then we know if one side is heavier than the other, then it's not flat anymore. It's out of balance. So let's say I'm going to add some B to my system at equilibrium, which has the equilibrium constant of 1. And with too much B, you can see that the seesaw is out of balance. So Le Chatelier's principle says that the system will react to go back to equilibrium. So to do this, the reaction has to be in the reverse direction, where B is converted to more A. Now after having B converted to more A, we get to a new equilibrium position where there are three A's in the reactant side and three B's on the product side. So again, K is equal to 1 because 3 over 3 is equal to 1. It's important to note that sometimes, like this system, you don't get back to the very same concentrations of reactants and products like we did in the top, where we have 2 over 2, but instead we have 3 over 3, but that is still equal to 1, and that gets us back to our equilibrium position. So let's look at another situation. What if instead of adding B, we removed B? Well, then there would be too much reactant, and the system would be out of balance, and the system would eventually have to reachieve balance by using some of the reactant to create some of the product. So when the A is converted to B, then I can get my system back to equilibrium, where again we see that we have a different number of A and B than we originally had, 
but we still have achieved the equilibrium constant value, which is one. So let's look at these scenarios one more time. So in the top scenario where B was added at equilibrium, notice that the system response was that some of the B product was converted back into A. So what we say for this, um, and we have certain ways of describing a system response, what we would say for the first scenario is that the reaction moves two reactants. Or left. For the second scenario, where B was removed initially and we had too much A, instead the system moves to products moves two products or it moves right. So depending on whether something is added or removed, we basically have two different scenarios. We can move towards products or we can move towards reactants. So at the bottom here, you basically have these two situations. So the reaction will move to products or the right if reactant is added or product is removed. The system will respond to produce reactants or move to the left if reactant is removed or product is added. So the second type of disturbance are pressure changes. So we're gonna talk about pressure changes that occur when a system volume changes. So to re refresh ourselves, going back to the gas law, the ideal gas law, we should remember that pressure is inversely proportional to the volume. So that's given by this expression here. So since they're inversely related, we expect them to do the opposite. So if I change the volume of a system by increasing it, I would expect the gas pressures to go down. If the volume of the system was decreased, I would expect the pressure to go upwards. So let's look at an example of a real chemical system. Here we have phosphorus trichloride reacting with chlorine gas to give phosphorus pentachloride. So the reactants and products are at equilibrium and the equilibrium constant expression is the pressure of the product over the products of the pressures of the reactants. So if I change the volume of this system, let's say I'm gonna decrease the volume and I expect the pressures to increase, but they don't increase the same here because there's two pressures on the bottom and there's only one pressure on the top. So the pressure on the bottom is gonna increase like the square root of a pressure and the pressure on the top is only gonna increase by one. So if, for example, if, I, if the pressures double then the bottom pressure really quadruples because two squared is four, but the top one only increases by two. Likewise, if I increase the volume, then the pressure on top is gonna decrease at a slower rate than the pressure on bottom because of the square root relationship. So basically what we see here is that when there are more gas um, particles on one side of the equilibrium symbol, then a pressure change affects that side more drastically. So let's look at each of these situations in a little more detail. So for our model system here, remember we have a decrease in volume, making the pressure go up. 
or an increase in volume making the pressure go down. So I'm going to call this situation 1 and the decreasing pressure situation 2. So to restate this, when the volume goes down and the pressure goes up, the side with more gas molecules really ends up getting too much pressure. And this needs to be relieved. So the easiest way to relieve this is have some of the product, the reactant in this case, move to create some more product and then that makes the denominator go down and the numerator go up until they get back to the equilibrium value. So again, what it, system one is going to do is it's going to react towards the product so that this pressure is decreased so that it can reachieve equilibrium. Now in scenario two, where the volume is increased, resulting in a pressure decrease, then what we see is the side again with more gas molecules, in this case, gets too little pressure. So the system is going to have to react to increase that pressure to get it back to its equilibrium value. So in scenario two, the system response is going to be to react towards the reactants to increase the pressure. So these responses can be further simplified into two, two lines. So what we'd say is for increases in pressure, we will react towards the side with the fewest gas molecules to reachieve or reestablish equilibrium. For a decrease in pressure, we will react towards the side with the most gas molecules so that the pressure can be increased and equilibrium be reestablished. So the final type of disturbance um, to equilibrium are temperature changes. So to remember how to deal with um, temperature changes, we first have to remember um, some important components of exothermic and endothermic reactions. So we should recall that heat is produced in an exothermic reaction, but heat is consumed during an endothermic reaction. So to help us apply Le Chatelier's principle to temperature changes, we're going to use this information that we know about heat. And if a reaction is deemed to be exothermic, then I'll write heat as a product. And if it's endothermic, we'll write heat as a reactant. When we do this, when we know whether or not heat is a product or a reactant, we can treat it exactly like a concentration change. And since we can treat it like a concentration change, then we can apply the same exact rules that we developed for concentration changes. So let's do an example to express this relationship. So we're going to look at the reaction where N2 reacts with O2 to produce, in an equilibrium situation, two NOs. And we're given information that delta H or the enthalpy change for this reaction, is 181 kilojoules. So we should remember if the enthalpy of the reaction is positive, it's an endothermic reaction. If it's negative, it's an exothermic reaction. So here we have a situation where we have an endothermic reaction. So with that information, I can rewrite my endothermic reaction where I put heat as a reactant. So there are a couple of ways we can disturb this equilibrium. The first one is if heat is added with an increase in temperature. If we do this, then the heat will end up being too high and the system will respond such that some of the reactant is converted to product or again, we move towards products 
And when this happens, the heat will decrease and the system will be able to maintain an equilibrium. The second response, or the second thing we can do to our system at equilibrium is to decrease the temperature and therefore remove heat from the system. If we remove heat as a reactant, then the system will move towards the reactants to generate a little bit more heat and get it back to its equilibrium position. It should be noted that in the case of temperature changes, then a different value of the equilibrium constant will be um, attained. Because just like rates, rate constants are constant at a given temperature, equilibrium constants are constant at a given temperature, but they all change when the temperature changes. So I think with heat, we can again boil it down into two conditions. Um, after first determining whether heat is a reactant or a product, based on whether the reaction is exothermic or endothermic, we can say that if we have an increase in temperature, then the system will reestablish equilibrium by reacting away from heat, or it will react in the opposite direction where heat is located in the balanced chemical reaction equation. For a decrease in temperature, the system will react towards the heat. So we'll react towards the side that has heat on it. So hopefully in this video, you've come very familiar with um, Le Chatelier's principle and how it describes changes that will occur in a system to re-achieve equilibrium when a disturbance has occurred.